Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Fifty Seven, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Fifty Seven which treats of how don quixote took leave of the duke and of what followed with the witty and impudent altisidora one of the duchess's damsels don quixote now felt it right to quit a life of such idleness as he was leading in the castle for he fancied that he was making himself sorely missed by suffering himself to remain shut up and inactive amid the countless luxuries and enjoyments his host lavished upon him as a knight and he felt too that he would have to render a strict account to heaven of that indolence and seclusion and so one day he asked the duke and duchess to grant him permission to take his departure they gave it showing at the same time that they were very sorry he was leaving them the duchess gave his wife's letters to sancho panza who shed tears over them saying who would have thought that such grand hopes as the news of my government bred in my wife teresa panza's breast would end in my going back now to the vagabond adventures of my master don quixote of la mancha still i am glad to see my teresa behaved as she ought in sending the acorns for if she had not sent them i'd have been sorry and she'd have shown herself ungrateful it is a comfort to me that they can't call that present a bribe for i had got the government already when she sent them and it's but reasonable that those who have had a good turn done them should show their gratitude if it's only with a trifle after all i went into the government naked and i come out of it naked so i can say with a safe conscience and that's no small matter naked i was born naked i find myself i neither lose nor gain thus did sancho soliloquize on the day of their departure as don quixote who had the night before taken leave of the duke and duchess coming out made his appearance at an early hour in full armour in the courtyard of the castle the whole household of the castle were watching him from the corridors and the duke and duchess too came out to see him sancho was mounted on his dapple with his alforjas valise and proven supremely happy because the duke's majordomo the same that had acted the part of the trifaldi had given him a little purse with two hundred gold crowns to meet the necessary expenses of the road but of this don quixote knew nothing as yet while all were as has been said observing him suddenly from among the duennas and handmaidens the impudent and witty altisidora lifted up her voice and said in pathetic tones give ear cruel knight draw rein where's the need of spurring the flanks of that ill-broken steed from what art thou flying no dragon i am not even a sheep but a tender young lamb thou hast jilted a maiden as fair to behold as nymph of diana or venus of old bireno aeneas what worse shall i call thee barabbas go with thee all evil befall thee in thy claws ruthless robber thou bearest away the heart of a meek loving maid for thy prey three kerchiefs thou stealest and garters a pair from legs then the whitest of marble more fair and the sighs that pursue thee would burn to the ground two thousand troy towns if so many were found Bireno, Aeneas, what worse shall I call thee? Barabbas go with thee, all evil befall thee. May no bowels of mercy to Sancho be granted, and thy Dulcinea be left still enchanted. May thy falsehood to me find its punishment in her, for in my land the just often pays for the sinner. May thy grandest adventures discomfitures prove. May thy joys be old dreams and forgotten thy love. Bireno, Aeneas, what worse shall I call thee? Barabbas go with thee, all evil befall thee. May thy name be abhorred for thy conduct to ladies, from London to England, from Seville to Cadiz. May thy cards be unlucky, thy hands contain ne'er a king, seven, or ace, when thou playest primera. When thy corns are cut, may it be to the quick. When thy grinders are drawn, may the roots of them stick. Bireno, Aeneas, what worse shall I call thee? Barabbas go with thee, all evil befall thee. All the while the unhappy Altisidora was bewailing herself in the above strain. Don Quixote stood staring at her, and without uttering a word in reply to her, 
he turned round to sancho and said sancho my friend i conjure thee by the life of thy forefathers tell me the truth say hast thou by any chance taken the three kerchiefs and the garters this lovesick maid speaks of to this sancho made answer the the three kerchiefs i have but the garters as much as over the hills of ubeda the duchess was amazed at altisidora's assurance she knew that she was bold lively and impudent but not so much so as to venture to make free in this fashion and not being prepared for the joke her astonishment was all the greater the duke had a mind to keep up the sport so he said it does not seem to me well done in you sir knight that after having received the hospitality that has been offered you in this very castle you should have ventured to carry off even three kerchiefs not to say my handmaid's garters it shows a bad heart and does not tally with your reputation restore her garters or else i defy you to mortal combat for i am not afraid of rascally enchanters changing or altering my features as they changed his who encountered you into those of my lackey tosilos god forbid said don quixote that i should draw my sword against your illustrious person from which i have received such great favours the kerchiefs i will restore as sancho says he has them as to the garters that is impossible for i have not got them neither has he and if your handmaiden here will look in her hiding-places depend upon it she will find them i have never been a thief my lord duke nor do i mean to be so long as i live if god cease not to have me in his keeping this damsel by her own confession speaks as one in love for which i am not to blame and therefore need not ask pardon either of her or of your excellence whom i entreat to have a better opinion of me and once more to give me leave to pursue my journey and may god so prosper it senor don quixote said the duchess that we may always hear good news of your exploits god speed you for the longer you stay the more you inflame the hearts of the damsels who behold you and as for this one of mine i will so chastise her that she will not transgress again either with her eyes or with her words one word and no more o valiant don quixote i ask you to hear said altisidora and that is that i beg your pardon about the theft of the garters for by god and upon my soul i have got them on and i have fallen into the same blunder as he did who went looking for his ass being all the while mounted on it didn't i say so said sancho i'm a likely one to hide thefts why if i wanted to deal in them opportunities came ready enough to me in my government don quixote bowed his head and saluted the duke and duchess and all the bystanders and wheeling rocinante round sancho following him on dapple he rode out of the castle shaping his course for saragossa end of volume two part two chapter fifty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter fifty eight of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter fifty eight which tells how adventures came crowding on don quixote in such numbers that they gave one another no breathing time when don quixote saw himself in open country free and relieved from the intentions of altisidora he felt at his ease and in fresh spirits to take up the pursuit of chivalry once more and turning to sancho he said freedom sancho is one of the most precious gifts that heaven has bestowed upon men no treasures that the earth holds buried or the sea conceals can compare with it for freedom as for honour life may and should be ventured and on the other hand captivity is the greatest evil that can fall to the lot of man i say this sancho because thou hast seen the good cheer the abundance we have enjoyed in this castle we are leaving well then amid those dainty banquets and snow-cooled beverages i felt as though i were undergoing the straits of hunger because i did not enjoy them with the same freedom as if they had been mine own for the sense of being under an obligation to return benefits and favours received is a restraint that checks the independence of the spirit happy he 
to whom heaven has given a piece of bread for which he is not bound to give thanks to any but heaven itself for all your worship says said sancho it is not becoming that there should be no thanks on our part for two hundred gold crowns that the duke's majordomo has given me in a little purse which i carry next my heart like a warming plaster or comforter to meet any chance calls for we shan't always find castles where they'll entertain us now and then we may light upon roadside inns where they'll cudgel us in conversation of this sort the knight and squire errant were pursuing their journey when after they had gone a little more than half a league they perceived some dozen men dressed like labourers stretched upon their cloaks on the grass of a green meadow eating their dinner they had beside them what seemed to be white sheets concealing some objects under them standing upright or lying flat and arranged at intervals don quixote approached the diners and saluting them courteously first he asked them what it was those cloths covered senor answered one of the party under these cloths are some images carved in relief intended for a retablo we are putting up in our village we carry them covered up that they may not be soiled and on our shoulders that they may not be broken with your good leave said don quixote i should like to see them for images that are carried so carefully no doubt must be fine ones i should think they were said the other let the money they cost speak for that for as a matter of fact there is not one of them that does not stand us in more than fifty ducats and that your worship may judge wait a moment and ye shall see with your own eyes and getting up from his dinner he went and uncovered the first image which proved to be one of st george on horseback with a serpent writhing at his feet and the lance thrust down its throat with all that fierceness that is usually depicted the whole group was one blaze of gold as the saying is on seeing it don quixote said that knight was one of the best knights errant the army of heaven ever owned he was called don st george and he was moreover a defender of maidens let us see this next one the man uncovered it and it was seen to be that of st martin on his horse dividing his cloak with the beggar the instant don quixote saw it he said this knight too was one of the christian adventurers but i believe he was generous rather than valiant as thou mayest perceive sancho by his dividing his cloak with the beggar and giving him half of it no doubt it was winter at the time for otherwise he would have given him the whole of it so charitable was he it was not that most likely said sancho but that he held with the proverb that says for giving and keeping there's need of brains don quixote laughed and asked them to take off the next cloth underneath which was seen the image of the patron saint of the spains seated on horseback his sword stained with blood trampling on moors and treading heads under foot and on seeing it don quixote exclaimed ay this is a knight and of the squadrons of christ this one is called don st james the moor slayer one of the bravest saints and knights the world ever had or heaven has now he then raised another cloth which it appeared covered st paul falling from his horse with all the details that are usually given in representations of his conversion when don quixote saw it rendered in such lifelike style that one would have said christ was speaking and paul answering this he said was in his time the greatest enemy that the church of god our lord had and the greatest champion it will ever have a knight-errant in life a steadfast saint in death an untiring labourer in the lord's vineyard a teacher of the gentiles whose school was heaven and whose instructor and master was jesus christ himself there were no more images so don quixote bade them cover them up again and said to those who had brought them i take it as a happy omen brothers to have seen what i have for these saints and knights were of the same profession as myself which is the calling of arms only there is this difference between them and me that they were saints and fought with divine weapons and i am a sinner and fight with human ones they won heaven by force of arms for heaven suffereth violence and i so far know not what i have won by dint of my sufferings but if my dulcinea del toboso were to be released from hers perhaps with mended fortunes and a mind restored to itself i might direct my steps in a better path than i am following at present may god hear and sin be deaf said sancho to this the men were filled with wonder as well at the figure as at the words of don quixote though they did not understand one half of what he meant by them they finished their dinner took their images on their backs and bidding farewell to don quixote resumed their journey 
Sancho was amazed afresh at the extent of his master's knowledge, as much as if he had never known him, for it seemed to him that there was no story or event in the world that he had not at his finger's ends and fixed in his memory, and he said to him, In truth, master mine, if this that has happened to us today is to be called an adventure, it has been one of the sweetest and pleasantest that have befallen us in the whole course of our travels. We have come out of it unbelabored and undismayed, neither have we drawn sword nor have we smitten the earth with our bodies nor have we been left famishing blessed be god that he has let me see such a thing with my own eyes thou sayest well sancho said don quixote but remember all times are not alike nor do they always run the same way and these things the vulgar commonly call omens which are not based upon any natural reason will by him who is wise be esteemed and reckoned happy accidents merely one of these believers in omens will get up of a morning, leave his house, and meet a friar of the order of the blessed St. Francis, and, as if he had met a griffin, he will turn about and go home. With another Mendoza the salt is spilt on his table, and gloom is spilt over his heart, as if nature was obliged to give warning of coming misfortunes by means of such trivial things as these. The wise man and the Christian should not trifle with what it may please heaven to do scipio on coming to africa stumbled as he leaped on shore his soldiers took it as a bad omen but he clasping the soil with his arms exclaimed thou canst not escape me africa for i hold thee tight between my arms thus sancho meeting those images has been to me a most happy occurrence i can well believe it said sancho but i wish your worship would tell me what is the reason that the spaniards when they are about to give battle and calling on that saint james the moorslayer say santiago and close spain is spain then open so that it is needful to close it or what is the meaning of this form thou art very simple sancho said don quixote god look you gave that great knight of the red cross to spain as her patron saint and protector especially in those hard struggles the spaniards had with the moors and therefore they invoke and call upon him as their defender in all their battles and in these he has been many a time seen beating down, trampling under foot, destroying and slaughtering the Hagarene squadrons in the sight of all, of which fact I could give thee many examples recorded in truthful Spanish histories. Sancho changed the subject and said to his master, I marvel, senor, at the boldness of Altisidora, the duchess's handmaid. He whom they call love must have cruelly pierced and wounded her. They say he is a little blind urchin, who, though blear-eyed, or more properly speaking sightless, if he aims at a heart, be it ever so small, hits it and pierces it through and through with his arrows. I have heard it said, too, that the arrows of love are blunted and robbed of their points by maidenly modesty and reserve. But with this Altisidora it seems they are sharpened rather than blunted. Bear in mind, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that love is influenced by no consideration recognizes no restraints of reason, and is of the same nature as death, that assails alike the lofty palaces of kings and the humble cabins of shepherds. And when it takes entire possession of a heart, the first thing it does is to banish fear and shame from it. And so without shame Altisidora declared her passion, which excited in my mind embarrassment rather than commiseration. Notable cruelty, exclaimed Sancho, unheard of ingratitude i can only say for myself that the very smallest loving word of hers would have subdued me and made a slave of me the devil what a heart of marble what bowels of brass what a soul of mortar but i can't imagine what it is that this damsel saw in your worship that could have conquered and captivated her so what gallant figure was it what bold bearing what sprightly grace what comeliness of feature which of these things by itself or what all together could have made her fall in love with you? For indeed, and in truth, many a time I stop to look at your worship from the sole of your foot to the topmost hair of your head, and I see more to frighten one than to make one fall in love. Moreover, I have heard say that beauty is the first and main thing that excites love, and as your worship has none at all, I don't know what the poor creature fell in love with. Recollect, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, there are two sorts of beauty one of the mind the other of the body that of the mind displays and exhibits itself in intelligence in modesty in honourable conduct in generosity in good breeding and all these qualities are possible and may exist in an ugly man 
and when it is this sort of beauty and not that of the body that is the attraction love is apt to spring up suddenly and violently i sancho perceive clearly enough that i am not beautiful but at the same time i know i am not hideous and it is enough for an honest man not to be a monster to be an object of love if only he possesses the endowments of mind i have mentioned while engaged in this discourse they were making their way through a wood that lay beyond the road when suddenly without expecting anything of the kind don quixote found himself caught in some nets of green cord stretched from one tree to another and unable to conceive what it could be he said to sancho sancho it strikes me this affair of these nets will prove one of the strangest adventures imaginable may i die if the enchanters that persecute me are not trying to entangle me in them and delay my journey by way of revenge for my obduracy towards altisidora well then let me tell them that if these nets instead of being green cord were made of the hardest diamonds or stronger than that wherewith the jealous god of blacksmiths enmeshed venus and mars i would break them as easily as if they were made of rushes or cotton threads but just as he was about to press forward and break through all suddenly from among some trees two shepherdesses of surpassing beauty presented themselves to his sight or at least damsels dressed like shepherdesses save that their jerkins and sayas were of fine brocade that is to say the sayas were rich farthingales of gold embroidered tabby their hair that in its golden brightness vied with the beams of the sun itself fell loose upon their shoulders and was crowned with garlands twined with green laurel and red everlasting and their years to all appearance were not under fifteen nor above eighteen such was the spectacle that filled sancho with amazement fascinated don quixote made the sun halt in his course to behold them and held all four in a strange silence one of the shepherdesses at length was the first to speak and said to don quixote hold sir knight and do not break these nets for they are not spread here to do you any harm but only for our amusement and as i know you will ask why they have been put up and who we are i will tell you in a few words in a village some two leagues from this where there are many people of quality and rich gentlefolk it was agreed upon by a number of friends and relations to come with their wives sons and daughters neighbours friends and kinsmen and make holiday in this spot which is one of the pleasantest in the whole neighbourhood setting up a new pastoral arcadia among ourselves we maidens dressing ourselves as shepherdesses and the youths as shepherds we have prepared two eclogues one by the famous poet garcilaso the other by the most excellent camoens in its own portuguese tongue but we have not as yet acted them yesterday was the first day of our coming here we have a few of what they say are called field tents pitched among the trees on the bank of an ample brook that fertilizes all these meadows last night we spread these nets in the trees here to snare the silly little birds that startled by the noise we make may fly into them if you please to be our guest senor you will be welcomed heartily and courteously for here just now neither care nor sorrow shall enter she held her peace and said no more and don quixote made answer of a truth fairest lady Acteon, when he unexpectedly beheld Diana bathing in the stream, could not have been more fascinated and wonderstruck than I at the sight of your beauty. I commend your mode of entertainment, and thank you for the kindness of your invitation. And if I can serve you, you may command me with full confidence of being obeyed, for my profession is none other than to show myself grateful and ready to serve persons of all conditions but especially persons of quality such as your appearance indicates and if instead of taking up as they probably do but a small space these nets took up the whole surface of the globe i would seek out new worlds through which to pass so as not to break them and that ye may give some degree of credence to this exaggerated language of mine know that it is no less than don quixote of la mancha that makes this declaration to you if indeed it be that such a name has reached your ears Ah friend of my soul instantly exclaimed the other shepherdess what great good fortune has befallen us seest thou this gentleman we have before us well then let me tell thee he is the most valiant and the most devoted and the most courteous gentleman in all the world unless a history of his achievements that has been printed and i have read is telling lies and deceiving us i will lay a wager that this good fellow who is with him is one sancho panza his squire whose drolleries none can equal 
that's true said sancho i am that same droll and squire you speak of and this gentleman is my master don quixote of la mancha the same that's in the history and that they talk about oh my friend said the other let us entreat him to stay for it will give our fathers and brothers infinite pleasure i too have heard just what thou hast told me of the valour of the one and the drolleries of the other and what is more of him they say that he is the most constant and loyal lover that was ever heard of and that his lady is one dulcinea del toboso to whom all over spain the palm of beauty is awarded and justly awarded said don quixote unless indeed your unequalled beauty makes it a matter of doubt but spare yourselves the trouble ladies of pressing me to stay for the urgent calls of my profession do not allow me to take rest under any circumstances at this instant there came up to the spot where the four stood a brother of one of the two shepherdesses like them in shepherd costume and as richly and gaily dressed as they were they told him that their companion was the valiant don quixote of la mancha and the other sancho his squire of whom he knew already from having read their history the gay shepherd offered him his services and begged that he would accompany him to their tents and don quixote had to give way and comply and now the game was started and the nets were filled with a variety of birds that deceived by the colour fell into the danger they were flying from upwards of thirty persons all gaily attired as shepherds and shepherdesses assembled on the spot and were at once informed who don quixote and his squire were whereat they were not a little delighted as they knew of him already through his history they repaired to the tents where they found tables laid out and choicely plentifully and neatly furnished they treated don quixote as a person of distinction giving him the place of honour and all observed him and were full of astonishment at the spectacle at last the cloth being removed don quixote with great composure lifted up his voice and said one of the greatest sins that men are guilty of is some will say pride but i say ingratitude going by the common saying that hell is full of ingrates this sin so far as it has lain in my power i have endeavoured to avoid ever since i have enjoyed the faculty of reason and if i am unable to requite good deeds that have been done me by other deeds i substitute the desire to do so and if that be not enough i make them known publicly for he who declares and makes known the good deeds done to him would repay them by others if it were in his power and for the most part those who receive are the inferiors of those who give thus god is superior to all because he is the supreme giver and the offerings of man fall short by an infinite distance of being a full return for the gifts of god but gratitude in some degree makes up for this deficiency and shortcoming i therefore grateful for the favour that has been extended to me here and unable to make a return in the same measure restricted as i am by the narrow limits of my power offer what i can and what i have to offer in my own way and so i declare that for two full days i will maintain in the middle of this highway leading to saragossa that these ladies disguised as shepherdesses who are here present are the fairest and most courteous maidens in the world excepting only the peerless dulcinea del toboso sole mistress of my thoughts be it said without offence to those who hear me ladies and gentlemen on hearing this sancho who had been listening with great attention cried out in a loud voice is it possible there is any one in the world who will dare to say and swear that this master of mine is a madman say gentlemen shepherds is there a village priest be he ever so wise or learned who could say what my master has said or is there knight-errant whatever renown he may have as a man of valour that could offer what my master has offered now don quixote turned upon sancho and with a countenance glowing with anger said to him is it possible sancho that there is any one in the whole world who will say thou art not a fool with a lining to match and i know not what trimmings of impertinence and roguery who asked thee to meddle in my affairs or to inquire whether i am a wise man or a blockhead hold thy peace answer me not a word saddle rocinante if he be unsaddled and let us go to put my offer into execution for with the right that i have on my side thou mayest reckon as vanquished all who shall venture to question it and in a great rage and showing his anger plainly he rose from his seat leaving the company lost in wonder 
and making them feel doubtful whether they ought to regard him as a madman or a rational being in the end though they sought to dissuade him from involving himself in such a challenge assuring him they admitted his gratitude as fully established and needing no fresh proofs to be convinced of his valiant spirit as those related in the history of his exploits were sufficient still don quixote persisted in his resolve and mounted on rocinante bracing his buckler on his arm and grasping his lance he posted himself in the middle of a high road that was not far from the green meadow sancho followed on dapple together with all the members of the pastoral gathering eager to see what would be the upshot of his vainglorious and extraordinary proposal don quixote then having as has been said planted himself in the middle of the road made the welkin ring with words to this effect ho ye travellers and wayfarers knights squires folk on foot or on horseback who pass this way or shall pass in the course of the next two days know that don quixote of la mancha knight-errant is posted here to maintain by arms that the beauty and courtesy enshrined in the nymphs that dwell in these meadows and groves surpass all upon earth putting aside the lady of my heart dulcinea del toboso wherefore let him who is of the opposite opinion come on for here i await him twice he repeated the same words and twice they fell unheard by any adventurer but fate that was guiding affairs for him from better to better so ordered it that shortly afterwards there appeared on the road a crowd of men on horseback many of them with lances in their hands all riding in a compact body and in great haste no sooner had those who were with don quixote seen them than they turned about and withdrew to some distance from the road they knew that if they stayed some harm might come to them but don quixote with intrepid heart stood his ground and sancho panza shielded himself with rocinante's hindquarters the troop of lancers came up and one of them who was in advance began shouting to don quixote get out of the way you son of the devil or these bulls will knock you to pieces rabble returned don quixote i care nothing for bulls be they the fiercest harama breeds on its banks confess at once scoundrels that what i have declared is true else ye have to deal with me in combat the herdsman had no time to reply nor don quixote to get out of the way even if he wished and so the drove of fierce bulls and tame bullocks together with a crowd of herdsmen and others who were taking them to be penned up in a village where they were to be run the next day passed over don quixote and over sancho rocinante and dapple hurling them all to the earth and rolling them over on the ground sancho was left crushed don quixote scared dapple belaboured and rocinante in no very sound condition they all got up however at length and don quixote in great haste stumbling here and falling there started off running after the drove shouting out hold stay ye rascally rabble a single knight awaits you and he is not of the temper or opinion of those who say for a flying enemy make a bridge of silver the retreating party in their haste however did not stop for that or heed his menaces any more than last year's clouds weariness brought don quixote to a halt and more enraged than avenged he sat down on the road to wait until sancho rocinante and dapple came up when they reached him master and man mounted once more and without going back to bid farewell to the mock or imitation arcadia and more in humiliation than contentment they continued their journey end of volume two part two chapter fifty eight Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 59 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby, 1829 to 1895. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 59. Wherein is related the strange thing which may be regarded as an adventure that happened to Don Quixote. A clear, limpid spring which they discovered in a cool grove relieved Don Quixote and Sancho of the dust and fatigue due to the unpolite behavior of the bulls 
and by the side of this having turned dapple and rocinante loose without headstall or bridle the forlorn pair master and man seated themselves sancho had recourse to the larder of his alforjas and took out of them what he called the prog don quixote rinsed his mouth and bathed his face by which cooling process his flagging energies were revived out of pure vexation he remained without eating and out of pure politeness sancho did not venture to touch a morsel of what was before him but waited for his master to act as taster seeing however that absorbed in thought he was forgetting to carry the bread to his mouth he said never a word and trampling every sort of good breeding under foot began to stow away in his paunch the bread and cheese that came to his hand eat sancho my friend said don quixote support life which is of more consequence to thee than to me and leave me to die under the pain of my thoughts and pressure of my misfortunes i was born sancho to live dying and thou to die eating and to prove the truth of what i say look at me printed in histories famed in arms courteous in behaviour honoured by princes courted by maidens and after all when i look forward to palms triumphs and crowns won and earned by my valiant deeds i have this morning seen myself trampled on kicked and crushed by the feet of unclean and filthy animals this thought blunts my teeth paralyzes my jaws cramps my hands and robs me of all appetite for food so much so that i have a mind to let myself die of hunger the cruelest death of all deaths so then said sancho munching hard all the time your worship does not agree with the proverb that says let martha die but let her die with a full belly i at any rate have no mind to kill myself so far from that i mean to do as the cobbler does who stretches the leather with his teeth until he makes it reach as far as he wants i'll stretch out my life by eating until it reaches the end heaven has fixed for it and let me tell you senor there's no greater folly than to think of dying of despair as your worship does take my advice and after eating lie down and sleep a bit on this green grass mattress and you will see that when you awake you'll feel something better don quixote did as he recommended for it struck him that sancho's reasoning was more like a philosopher's than a blockhead's and said he sancho if thou wilt do for me what i am going to tell thee my ease of mind would be more assured and my heaviness of heart not so great and it is this to go aside a little while i am sleeping in accordance with thy advice and making bare thy carcass to the air to give thyself three or four hundred lashes with rocinante's reins on account of the three thousand and odd thou art to give thyself for the disenchantment of dulcinea for it is a great pity that the poor lady should be left enchanted through thy carelessness and negligence there is a good deal to be said on that point said sancho let us both go to sleep now and after that god has decreed what will happen let me tell your worship that for a man to whip himself in cold blood is a hard thing especially if the stripes fall upon an ill-nourished and worse-fed body let my lady dulcinea have patience and when she is least expecting it she will see me made a riddle of with whipping and until death it's all life i mean that i have still life in me and the desire to make good what i have promised don quixote thanked him and ate a little and sancho a good deal and then they both lay down to sleep leaving those two inseparable friends and comrades rocinante and dapple to their own devices and to feed unrestrained upon the abundant grass with which the meadow was furnished they woke up rather late mounted once more and resumed their journey pushing on to reach an inn which was in sight apparently a league off i say an inn because don quixote called it so contrary to his usual practice of calling all inns castles they reached it and asked the landlord if they could put up there he said yes with as much comfort and as good fare as they could find in saragossa they dismounted and sancho stowed away his larder in a room of which the landlord gave him the key he took the beasts to the stable fed them and came back to see what orders don quixote who was seated on a bench at the door had for him giving special thanks to heaven that this inn had not been taken for a castle by his master supper time came and they repaired to their room and sancho asked the landlord what he had to give them for supper 
to this the landlord replied that his mouth should be the measure he had only to ask what he would for that inn was provided with the birds of the air and the fowls of the earth and the fish of the sea there's no need of all that said sancho if they'll roast us a couple of chickens we'll be satisfied for my master is delicate and eats little and i'm not over and above gluttonous the landlord replied he had no chickens for the kites had stolen them well then said sancho let senor landlord tell them to roast a pullet so that it is a tender one pullet my father said the landlord indeed and in truth it's only yesterday i sent over fifty to the city to sell but saving pullets ask what you will in that case said sancho you will not be without veal or kid just now said the landlord there's none in the house for it's all finished but next week there will be enough in to spare much good that does us said sancho i'll lay a bet that all these shortcomings are going to wind up in plenty of bacon and eggs by god said the landlord my guest's wits must be precious dull i tell him i have neither pullets nor hens and he wants me to have eggs talk of other dainties if you please and don't ask for hens again body o me said sancho let's settle the matter say at once what you have got and let us have no more words about it in truth and earnest senor guest said the landlord all i have is a couple of cow heels like calves feet or a couple of calves feet like cow heels they are boiled with chickpeas onions and bacon and at this moment they are crying come eat me come eat me i mark them for mine on the spot said sancho let nobody touch them i'll pay better for them than any one else for i could not wish for anything more to my taste and i don't care a pin whether they are feet or heels nobody shall touch them said the landlord for the other guests i have being persons of high quality bring their own cook and caterer and larder with them if you come to people of quality said sancho there's nobody more so than my master but the calling he follows did not allow of larders or store-rooms we lay ourselves down in the middle of the meadow and fill ourselves with acorns or medlars here ended sancho's conversation with the landlord sancho not caring to carry it any farther by answering him for he had already asked him what calling or what profession it was his master was of supper time having come then don quixote betook himself to his room the landlord brought in the stew-pan just as it was and he sat himself down to sup very resolutely it seems that in another room which was next to don quixote's with nothing but a thin partition to separate it he overheard these words as you live senor don hieronimo while they are bringing supper let us read another chapter of the second part of don quixote of la mancha the instant don quixote heard his own name he started to his feet and listened with open ears to catch what they said about him and heard the don jeronimo who had been addressed say in reply why would you have us read that absurd stuff don juan when it is impossible for any one who has read the first part of the history of don quixote of la mancha to take any pleasure in reading the second part for all that said he who was addressed as don juan we shall do well to read it for there is no book so bad but it has something good in it what displeases me most in it is that it represents don quixote as now cured of his love for dulcinea del toboso on hearing this don quixote full of wrath and indignation lifted up his voice and said whoever he may be who says that don quixote of la mancha has forgotten or can forget dulcinea del toboso i will teach him with equal arms that what he says is very far from the truth for neither can the peerless dulcinea del toboso be forgotten nor can forgetfulness have a place in don quixote his motto is constancy and his profession to maintain the same with his life and never wrong it who is this that answers us said they in the next room who should it be said sancho but don quixote of la mancha himself who will make good all he has said and all he will say for pledges don't trouble a good payer sancho had hardly uttered these words when two gentlemen for such they seemed to be entered the room and one of them throwing his arms round don quixote's neck said to him your appearance cannot leave any question as to your name nor can your name fail to identify your appearance unquestionably senor you are the real don quixote of la mancha 
sinosure and morning star of knight errantry despite and in defiance of him who has sought to usurp your name and bring to naught your achievements as the author of this book which i here present to you has done and with this he put a book which his companion carried into the hands of don quixote who took it and without replying began to run his eye over it but he presently returned it saying in the little i have seen i have discovered three things in this author that deserve to be censured the first is some words that i have read in the preface the next that the language is aragonese for sometimes he writes without articles and the third which above all stamps him as ignorant is that he goes wrong and departs from the truth in the most important part of the history for here he says that my squire sancho panza's wife is called mari gutierrez when she is called nothing of the sort but teresa panza and when a man errs on such an important point as this there is good reason to fear that he is in error on every other point in the history a nice sort of historian indeed exclaimed sancho at this he must know a deal about our affairs when he calls my wife teresa panza mari gutierrez take the book again senor and see if i am in it and if he has changed my name from your talk friend said don jeronimo no doubt you are sancho panza senor don quixote's squire yes i am said sancho and i'm proud of it faith then said the gentleman this new author does not handle you with the decency that displays itself in your person he makes you out a heavy feeder and a fool and not in the least droll and a very different being from the sancho described in the first part of your master's history god forgive him said sancho he might have left me in my corner without troubling his head about me let him who knows how ring the bells st peter is very well in rome the two gentlemen pressed don quixote to come into their room and have supper with them as they knew very well there was nothing in that inn fit for one of his sort don quixote who was always polite yielded to their request and supped with them sancho stayed behind with the stew and invested with plenary delegated authority seated himself at the head of the table and the landlord sat down with him for he was no less fond of cow heel and calves feet than sancho was while at supper don juan asked don quixote what news he had of the lady dulcinea del toboso was she married had she been brought to bed or was she with child or did she in maidenhood still preserving her modesty and delicacy cherish the remembrance of the tender passion of senor don quixote to this he replied dulcinea is a maiden still in my passion more firmly rooted than ever our intercourse unsatisfactory as before and her beauty transformed into that of a foul country wench and then he proceeded to give them a full and particular account of the enchantment of dulcinea and of what had happened him in the cave of montesinos together with what the sage merlin had prescribed for her disenchantment namely the scourging of sancho exceedingly great was the amusement the two gentlemen derived from hearing don quixote recount the strange incidents of his history and if they were amazed by his absurdities they were equally amazed by the elegant style in which he delivered them on the one hand they regarded him as a man of wit and sense and on the other he seemed to them a maundering blockhead and they could not make up their minds whereabouts between wisdom and folly they ought to place him sancho having finished his supper and left the landlord in the ex condition repaired to the room where his master was and as he came in said may i die sirs if the author of this book your worships have got has any mind that we should agree as he calls me glutton according to what your worships say i wish he may not call me drunkard too but he does said don jeronimo i cannot remember however in what way though i know his words are offensive and what is more lying as i can see plainly by the physiognomy of the worthy sancho before me believe me said sancho the sancho and the don quixote of this history must be different persons from those that appear in the one seed hamet benengeli wrote who are ourselves my master valiant wise and true in love and i simple droll and neither glutton nor drunkard i believe it said don juan and were it possible an order should be issued that no one should have the presumption to deal with anything relating to don quixote save his original author seed hamet 
just as alexander commanded that no one should presume to paint his portrait save apelles let him who will paint me said don quixote but let him not abuse me for patience will often break down when they heap insults upon it none can be offered to senor don quixote said don juan that he himself will not be able to avenge if he does not ward it off with the shield of his patience which i take it is great and strong a considerable portion of the night passed in conversation of this sort and though don juan wished don quixote to read more of the book to see what it was all about he was not to be prevailed upon saying that he treated it as read and pronounced it utterly silly and if by any chance it should come to its author's ears that he had it in his hand he did not want him to flatter himself with the idea that he had read it for our thoughts and still more our eyes should keep themselves aloof from what is obscene and filthy they asked him whether he meant to direct his steps he replied to saragossa to take part in the harness jousts which were held in that city every year don juan told him that the new history described how don quixote let him be who he might took part there in a tilting at the ring utterly devoid of invention poor in mottoes very poor in costume though rich in sillinesses for that very reason said don quixote i will not set foot in saragossa and by that means i shall expose to the world the lie of this new history writer and people will see that i am not the don quixote he speaks of you will do quite right said don jeronimo and there are other jousts at barcelona in which senor don quixote may display his prowess that is what i mean to do said don quixote and as it is now time i pray your worships to give me leave to retire to bed and to place and retain me among the number of your greatest friends and servants and me too said sancho maybe i'll be good for something with this they exchanged farewells and don quixote and sancho retired to their room leaving don juan and don jeronimo amazed to see the medley he made of his good sense and his craziness and they felt thoroughly convinced that these and not those their aragonese author described were the genuine don quixote and sancho don quixote rose betimes and bade adieu to his host by knocking at the partition of the other room sancho paid the landlord magnificently and recommended him either to say less about the providing of his inn or to keep it better provided end of volume two part two chapter fifty nine Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 60 of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby, 1829 to 1895. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 60 Of What Happened to Don Quixote on His Way to Barcelona It was a fresh morning giving promise of a cool day as Don Quixote quitted the inn, first of all taking care to ascertain the most direct road to Barcelona without touching upon Saragossa. So anxious was he to make out this new historian who they said abused him so to be a liar well as it fell out nothing worthy of being recorded happened him for six days at the end of which having turned aside out of the road he was overtaken by night in a thicket of oak or cork trees for on this point seed hamet is not as precise as he usually is on other matters master and man dismounted from their beasts and as soon as they had settled themselves at the foot of the trees sancho who had had a good noontide meal that day let himself without more ado pass the gates of sleep but don quixote whom his thoughts far more than hunger kept awake could not close an eye and roamed in fancy to and fro through all sorts of places at one moment it seemed to him that he was in the cave of montesinos and saw dulcinea transformed into a country wench skipping and mounting upon her she-ass again that the words of the sage merlin were sounding in his ears setting forth the conditions to be observed and the exertions to be made for the disenchantment of dulcinea he lost all patience when he considered the laziness and want of charity of his squire sancho 
for to the best of his belief he had only given himself five lashes a number paltry and disproportioned to the vast number required at this thought he felt such vexation and anger that he reasoned the matter thus if alexander the great cut the gordian knot saying to cut comes to the same thing as to untie and yet did not fail to become lord paramount of all asia neither more nor less could happen now in dulcinea's disenchantment if i scourge sancho against his will for if it is the condition of the remedy that sancho shall receive three thousand and odd lashes what does it matter to me whether he inflicts them himself or some one else inflicts them when the essential point is that he receives them let them come from whatever quarter they may with this idea he went over to sancho having first taken rocinante's reins and arranged them so as to be able to flog him with them and began to untie the points the common belief is he had but one in front by which his breeches were held up but the instant he approached him sancho woke up in his full senses and cried out what is this who is touching me and untrussing me it is i said don quixote and i come to make good thy shortcomings and relieve my own distresses i come to whip thee sancho and wipe off some portion of the debt thou hast undertaken dulcinea is perishing thou art living on regardless i am dying of hope deferred therefore untrust thyself with a good will for mine it is here in this retired spot to give thee at least two thousand lashes not a bit of it said sancho let your worship keep quiet or else by the living god the deaf shall hear us the lashes i pledged myself to must be voluntary and not forced upon me and just now i have no fancy to whip myself it is enough if i give you my word to flog and flap myself when i have a mind it will not do to leave it to thy courtesy sancho said don quixote for thou art hard of heart and though a clown tender of flesh and at the same time he strove and struggled to untie him seeing this sancho got up and grappling with his master he gripped him with all his might in his arms giving him a trip with the heel stretched him on the ground on his back and pressing his right knee on his chest held his hands in his own so that he could neither move nor breathe how now traitor exclaimed don quixote dost thou revolt against thy master and natural lord dost thou rise against him who gives thee his bread i neither put down king nor set up king said sancho i only stand up for myself who am my own lord if your worship promises me to be quiet and not to offer to whip me now i'll let you go free and unhindered if not traitor and dona sancha's foe thou diest on the spot don quixote gave his promise and swore by the life of his thoughts not to touch so much as a hair of his garments and to leave him entirely free and to his own discretion to whip himself whenever he pleased sancho rose and removed some distance from the spot but as he was about to place himself leaning against another tree he felt something touch his head and putting up his hands encountered somebody's two feet with shoes and stockings on them he trembled with fear and made for another tree where the very same thing happened to him and he fell a shouting calling upon don quixote to come and protect him don quixote did so and asked him what had happened to him and what he was afraid of sancho replied that all the trees were full of men's feet and legs don quixote felt them and guessed at once what it was and said to sancho thou hast nothing to be afraid of for these feet and legs that thou feelest but canst not see belong no doubt to some outlaws and freebooters that have been hanged on these trees for the authorities in these parts are wont to hang them up by twenties and thirties when they catch them whereby i conjecture that i must be near barcelona and it was in fact as he supposed with the first light they looked up and saw that the fruit hanging on those trees were freebooters bodies and now day dawned and if the dead freebooters had scared them their hearts were no less troubled by upwards of forty living ones who all of a sudden surrounded them and in the catalan tongue bade them stand and wait until their captain came up don quixote was on foot with his horse unbridled and his lance leaning against a tree and in short completely defenceless he thought it best therefore to fold his arms and bow his head and reserve himself for a more favourable occasion and opportunity 
the robbers made haste to search dapple and did not leave him a single thing of all he carried in the alforjas and in the valise and lucky it was for sancho that the duke's crowns and those he brought from home were in a girdle that he wore round him but for all that these good folk would have stripped him and even looked to see what he had hidden between the skin and flesh but for the arrival at that moment of their captain who was about thirty-four years of age apparently strongly built above the middle height of stern aspect and swarthy complexion he was mounted upon a powerful horse and had on a coat of mail with four of the pistols they call petronels in that country at his waist he saw that his squires for so they call those who follow that trade were about to rifle sancho panza but he ordered them to desist and was at once obeyed so the girdle escaped he wondered to see the lance leaning against the tree the shield on the ground and don quixote in armour and dejected with the saddest and most melancholy face that sadness itself could produce and going up to him he said be not so cast down good man for you have not fallen into the hands of any inhuman busiris but into roque guinarts which are more merciful than cruel the cause of my dejection returned don quixote is not that i have fallen into thy hands o valiant roque whose fame is bounded by no limits on earth but that my carelessness should have been so great that thy soldiers should have caught me unbridled when it is my duty according to the rule of knight-errantry which i profess to be always on the alert and at all times my own sentinel for let me tell thee great roque had they found me on my horse with my lance and shield it would not have been very easy for them to reduce me to submission for i am don quixote of la mancha he who hath filled the whole world with his achievements roque guinart at once perceived that don quixote's weakness was more akin to madness than to swagger though he had sometimes heard him spoken of he never regarded the things attributed to him as true nor could he persuade himself that such a humour could become dominant in the heart of man he was extremely glad therefore to meet him and test at close quarters what he had heard of him at a distance so he said to him despair not valiant knight nor regard as an untoward fate the position in which thou findest thyself it may be that by these slips thy crooked fortune will make itself straight for heaven by strange circuitous ways mysterious and incomprehensible to man raises up the fallen and makes rich the poor don quixote was about to thank him when they heard behind them a noise as of a troop of horses there was however but one riding on which at a furious pace came a youth apparently about twenty years of age clad in green damask edged with gold and breeches and a loose frock with a hat looped up in the walloon fashion tight-fitting polished boots gilt spurs dagger and sword and in his hand a musketoon and a pair of pistols at his waist roque turned round at the noise and perceived this comely figure which drawing near thus addressed him i come in quest of thee valiant roque to find in thee if not a remedy at least relief in my misfortune and not to keep thee in suspense for i see thou dost not recognize me i will tell thee who i am i am claudia Heronima, the daughter of simon forte thy good friend and special enemy of claucal tereas who is thine also as being of the faction opposed to thee thou knowest that this tereas has a son who is called or at least was not two hours since don vicente tereas well to cut short the tale of my misfortune i will tell thee in a few words what this youth has brought upon me he saw me he paid court to me i listened to him and unknown to my father i loved him for there is no woman however secluded she may live or close she may be kept who will not have opportunities and to spare for following her headlong impulses in a word he pledged himself to be mine and i promised to be his without carrying matters any further yesterday i learned that forgetful of his pledge to me he was about to marry another and that he was to go this morning to plight his troth intelligence which overwhelmed and exasperated me my father not being at home i was able to adopt this costume you see and urging my horse to speed i overtook don vicente about a league from this and without waiting to utter reproaches or hear excuses i fired this musket at him and these two pistols besides and to the best of my belief i must have lodged more than two bullets in his body opening doors to let my honour go free enveloped in his blood i left him there in the hands of his servants who did not dare 
and were not able to interfere in his defence and i come to seek from thee a safe conduct into france where i have relatives with whom i can live and also to implore thee to protect my father so that don vicente's numerous kinsmen may not venture to wreak their lawless vengeance upon him roque filled with admiration at the gallant bearing high spirit comely figure and adventure of the fair claudia said to her come senora let us go and see if thy enemy is dead and then we will consider what will be best for thee don quixote who had been listening to what claudia said and roque guinart said in reply to her exclaimed nobody need trouble himself with the defence of this lady for i take it upon myself give me my horse and arms and wait for me here i will go in quest of this knight and dead or alive i will make him keep his word plighted to so great beauty nobody need have any doubt about that said sancho for my master has a very happy knack of matchmaking it's not many days since he forced another man to marry who in the same way backed out of his promise to another maiden and if it had not been for his persecutors the enchanters changing the man's proper shape into a lackey's the said maiden would not be one this minute roque who was paying more attention to the fair claudia's adventure than to the words of master or man did not hear them and ordering his squires to restore to sancho everything they had stripped dapple of he directed them to return to the place where they had been quartered during the night and then set off with claudia at full speed in search of the wounded or slain don vicente they reached the spot where claudia met him but found nothing there save freshly spilt blood looking all around however they descried some people on the slope of a hill above them and concluded as indeed it proved to be that it was don vicente whom either dead or alive his servants were removing to attend to his wounds or to bury him they made haste to overtake them which as the party moved slowly they were able to do with ease they found don vicente in the arms of his servants whom he was entreating in a broken feeble voice to leave him there to die as the pain of his wounds would not suffer him to go any farther claudia and roque threw themselves off their horses and advanced towards him the servants were overawed by the appearance of roque and claudia was moved by the sight of don vicente and going up to him half tenderly half sternly she seized his hand and said to him hadst thou given me this according to our compact thou hadst never come to this pass the wounded gentleman opened his all but closed eyes and recognizing claudia said i see clearly fair and mistaken lady that it is thou that hast slain me a punishment not merited or deserved by my feelings towards thee for never did i mean to nor could i wrong thee in thought or deed it is not true then said claudia that thou wert going this morning to marry leonora the daughter of the rich balvastro assuredly not replied don quixote my cruel fortune must have carried those tidings to thee to drive thee in thy jealousy to take my life and to assure thyself of this press my hands and take me for thy husband if thou wilt i have no better satisfaction to offer thee for the wrong thou fanciest thou hast received from me claudia wrung his hands and her own heart was so wrung that she lay fainting on the bleeding breast of don vicente whom a death spasm seized the same instant roque was in perplexity and knew not what to do the servants ran to fetch water to sprinkle their faces and brought some and bathed them with it claudia recovered from her fainting fit but not so don vicente from the paroxysm that had overtaken him for his life had come to an end on perceiving this claudia when she had convinced herself that her beloved husband was no more rent the air with her sighs and made the heavens ring with her lamentations she tore her hair and scattered it to the winds she beat her face with her hands and showed all the signs of grief and sorrow that could be conceived to come from an afflicted heart cruel reckless woman she cried how easily wert thou moved to carry out a thought so wicked o furious force of jealousy to what desperate lengths dost thou lead those that give thee lodging in their bosoms o a husband whose unhappy fate in being mine hath borne thee from the marriage bed to the grave so vehement and so piteous were the lamentations of claudia that they drew tears from roque's eyes unused as they were to shed them on any occasion the servants wept claudia swooned away again and again and the whole place seemed a field of sorrow and an abode of misfortune 
in the end roque guinart directed don vicente's servants to carry his body to his father's village which was close by for burial claudia told him she meant to go to a monastery of which an aunt of hers was abbess where she intended to pass her life with a better and everlasting spouse he applauded her pious resolution and offered to accompany her whithersoever she wished and to protect her father against the kinsmen of don vicente and all the world should they seek to injure him claudia would not on any account allow him to accompany her and thanking him for his offers as well as she could took leave of him in tears the servants of don vicente carried away his body and roque returned to his comrades and so ended the love of claudia Geronima. but what wonder when it was the insuperable and cruel might of jealousy that wove the web of her sad story roque guinart found his squires at the place to which he had ordered them and don quixote and rocinante in the midst of them delivering a harangue to them in which he urged them to give up a mode of life so full of peril as well to the soul as to the body but as most of them were gascons rough lawless fellows his speech did not make much impression on them roque on coming up asked sancho if his men had returned and restored to them the treasures and jewels they had stripped off dapple sancho said they had but that three kerchiefs that were worth three cities were missing what are you talking about man said one of the bystanders i have got them and they are not worth three reals that is true said don quixote but my squire values them at the rate he says as having been given me by the person who gave them roque guinart ordered them to be restored at once and making his men fall in in line he directed all the clothing jewellery and money that they had taken since the last distribution to be produced and making a hasty valuation and reducing what could not be divided into money he made shares for the whole band so equitably and carefully that in no case did he exceed or fall short of strict distributive justice when this had been done and all left satisfied roque observed to don quixote if this scrupulous exactness were not observed with these fellows there would be no living with them upon this sancho remarked from what i have seen here justice is such a good thing that there is no doing without it even among the thieves themselves one of the squires heard this and raising the butt-end of his harquebus would no doubt have broken sancho's head with it had not roque guinart called out to him to hold his hand sancho was frightened out of his wits and vowed not to open his lips so long as he was in the company of these people at this instant one or two of those squires who were posted as sentinels on the roads to watch who came along them and report what passed to their chief came up and said senor there is a great troop of people not far off coming along the road to barcelona to which roque replied hast thou made out whether they are of the sort that are after us or of the sort we are after the sort we are after said the squire well then away with you all said roque and bring them here to me at once without letting one of them escape they obeyed and don quixote sancho and roque left by themselves waited to see what the squires brought and while they were waiting roque said to don quixote it must seem a strange sort of life to senor don quixote this of ours strange adventures strange incidents and all full of danger and i do not wonder that it should seem so for in truth i must own there is no mode of life more restless or anxious than ours what led me into it was a certain thirst for vengeance which is strong enough to disturb the quietest hearts i am by nature tender-hearted and kindly but as i said the desire to revenge myself for a wrong that was done me so overturns all my better impulses that i keep on in this way of life in spite of what conscience tells me and as one depth calls to another and one sin to another sin revenges have linked themselves together and i have taken upon myself not only my own but those of others it pleases god however that though i see myself in this maze of entanglements i do not lose all hope of escaping from it and reaching a safe port don quixote was amazed to hear roque utter such excellent and just sentiments for he did not think that among those who followed such trades as robbing murdering and waylaying there could be any one capable of a virtuous thought and he said in reply senor roque the beginning of health lies in knowing the disease and in the sick man's willingness to take the medicines which the physician prescribes you are sick 
you know what ails you and heaven or more properly speaking god who is our physician will administer medicines that will cure you and cure gradually and not of a sudden or by a miracle besides sinners of discernment are nearer amendment than those who are fools and as your worship has shown good sense in your remarks all you have to do is to keep up a good heart and trust that the weakness of your conscience will be strengthened and if you have any desire to shorten the journey and put yourself easily in the way of salvation come with me and i will show you how to become a knight-errant a calling wherein so many hardships and mishaps are encountered that if they be taken as penances they will lodge you in heaven in a trice roque laughed at don quixote's exhortation and changing the conversation he related the tragic affair a claudia Jeronima, at which sancho was extremely grieved for he had not found the young woman's beauty boldness and spirit at all amiss and now the squire's dispatch to make the prize came up bringing with them two gentlemen on horseback two pilgrims on foot and a coach full of women with some six servants on foot and on horseback in attendance on them and a couple of muleteers whom the gentlemen had with them the squires made a ring round them both victors and vanquished maintaining profound silence waiting for the great roque guinart to speak he asked the gentlemen who they were whither they were going and what money they carried with them senor replied one of them we are two captains of spanish infantry our companies are at naples and we are on our way to embark in four galleys which they say are at barcelona under orders for sicily and we have about two or three hundred crowns with which we are according to our notions rich and contented for a soldier's poverty does not allow a more extensive hoard roque asked the pilgrims the same questions he had put to the captains and was answered that they were going to take ship for rome and that between them they might have about sixty reals he asked also who was in the coach whither they were bound and what money they had and one of the men on horseback replied the persons in the coach are my lady dona guiomar de quinones wife of the regent of the vicaria at naples her little daughter a handmaid and a duenna we six servants are in attendance upon her and the money amounts to six hundred crowns so then said roque guinart we have got here nine hundred crowns and sixty reals my soldiers must number some sixty see how much there falls to each for i am a bad arithmetician as soon as the robbers heard this they raised a shout of long life to roque guinart in spite of the yadres that seek his ruin the captain showed plainly the concern they felt the regent's lady was downcast and the pilgrims did not at all enjoy seeing their property confiscated roque kept them in suspense in this way for a while but he had no desire to prolong their distress which might be seen a bowshot off and turning to the captains he said sirs will your worships be pleased of your courtesy to lend me sixty crowns and her ladyship the regent's wife eighty to satisfy this band that follows me for it is by his singing the abbot gets his dinner and then you may at once proceed on your journey free and unhindered with a safe conduct which i shall give you so that if you come across any other bands of mine that i have scattered in these parts they may do you no harm for i have no intention of doing injury to soldiers or to any woman especially one of quality profuse and hearty were the expressions of gratitude with which the captains thanked roque for his courtesy and generosity for such they regarded his leaving them their own money senora dona guiomar de quinones wanted to throw herself out of the coach to kiss the feet and hands of the great roque but he would not suffer it on any account so far from that he begged her pardon for the wrong he had done her under pressure of the inexorable necessities of his unfortunate calling the regent's lady ordered one of her servants to give the eighty crowns that had been assessed as her share at once for the captains had already paid down their sixty the pilgrims were about to give up the whole of their little hoard but roque bade them keep quiet and turning to his men he said of these crowns two full to each man and twenty remain over let ten be given to these pilgrims and the other ten to this worthy squire that he may be able to speak favourably of this adventure and then having writing materials with which he always went provided brought to him he gave them in writing a safe conduct to the leaders of his bands and bidding them farewell let them go free and filled with admiration at his magnanimity his generous disposition and his unusual conduct and inclined to regard him as an alexander the great 
rather than a notorious robber one of the squires observed in his mixture of gascon and catalan this captain of ours would make a better friar than highwayman if he wants to be so generous another time let it be with his own property and not ours the unlucky white did not speak so low but that roque overheard him and drawing his sword almost split his head in two saying that is the way i punish impudent saucy fellows they were all taken aback and not one of them dared to utter a word such deference did they pay him roque then withdrew to one side and wrote a letter to a friend of his at barcelona telling him that the famous don quixote of la mancha the knight-errant of whom there was so much talk was with him and was he assured him the drollest and wisest man in the world and that in four days from that date that is to say on st john the baptist's day he was going to deposit him in full armour mounted on his horse rocinante together with his squire sancho on an ass in the middle of the strand of the city and bidding him give notice of this to his friends the niaros that they might divert themselves with him he wished he said his enemies the cadells could be deprived of this pleasure but that was impossible because the crazes and shrewd sayings of don quixote and the humours of his squire sancho panza could not help giving general pleasure to all the world he dispatched the letter by one of his squires who exchanging the costume of a highwayman for that of a peasant made his way into barcelona and gave it to the person to whom it was directed end of volume two part two chapter sixty recording by expatriate in bangor maine Volume two, part two, chapter sixty one of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, part two, chapter sixty one of what happened to Don Quixote on entering Barcelona together with other matters that partake of the true rather than of the ingenious don quixote passed three days and three nights with roque and had he passed three hundred years he would have found enough to observe and wonder at in his mode of life at daybreak they were in one spot at dinner-time in another sometimes they fled without knowing from whom at other times they lay in wait not knowing for what they slept standing breaking their slumbers to shift from place to place there was nothing but sending out spies and scouts posting sentinels and blowing the matches of harquebuses though they carried but few for almost all used flintlocks roquet passed his nights in some place or other apart from his men that they might not know where he was for the many proclamations the viceroy of barcelona had issued against his life kept him in fear and uneasiness and he did not venture to trust any one afraid that even his own men would kill him or deliver him up to the authorities of a truth a weary miserable life at length by unfrequented roads short cuts and secret paths roque don quixote and sancho together with six squires set out for barcelona they reached the strand on st john's eve during the night and roque after embracing don quixote and sancho to whom he presented the ten crowns he had promised but had not until then given left them with many expressions of good-will on both sides roque went back while don quixote remained on horseback just as he was waiting for day and it was not long before the countenance of the fair aurora began to show itself at the balconies of the east gladdening the grass and flowers if not the ear though to gladden that too there came at the same moment a sound of clarions and drums and a din of bells and a tramp tramp and cries of clear the way there of some runners that seemed to issue from the city the dawn made way for the sun that with a face broader than a buckler began to rise slowly above the low line of the horizon don quixote and sancho gazed all round them they beheld the sea a sight until then unseen by them it struck them as exceedingly spacious and broad much more so than the lakes of ruidera which they had seen in la mancha they saw the galleys along the beach which lowering their awnings displayed themselves decked with streamers and pennons that trembled in the breeze and kissed and swept the water while on board the bugles trumpets and clarions were sounding 
and filling the air far and near with melodious warlike notes then they began to move and execute a kind of skirmish upon the calm water while a vast number of horsemen on fine horses and in showy liveries issuing from the city engaged on their side in a somewhat similar movement the soldiers on board the galleys kept up a ceaseless fire which they on the walls and forts of the city returned and the heavy cannon rent the air with the tremendous noise they made to which the gangway guns of the galleys replied the bright sea the smiling earth the clear air though at times darkened by the smoke of the guns all seemed to fill the whole multitude with unexpected delight sancho could not make out how it was that those great masses that moved over the sea had so many feet and now the horsemen in livery came galloping up with shouts and outlandish cries and cheers to where don quixote stood amazed and wondering and one of them he to whom roque had sent word addressing him exclaimed welcome to our city mirror beacon star and cynosure of all knight-errantry in its widest extent welcome i say valiant don quixote of la mancha not the false the fictitious the apocryphal that these latter days have offered us in lying histories but the true the legitimate the real one that cid hamet benengeli flower of historians has described to us don quixote made no answer nor did the horsemen wait for one but wheeling again with all their followers they began curvetting round don quixote who turning to sancho said these gentlemen have plainly recognized us i will wager they have read our history and even that newly printed one by the aragonese the cavalier who had addressed don quixote again approached him and said come with us senor don quixote for we are all of us your servants and great friends of roque guinart's to which don quixote returned if courtesy breeds courtesy yours sir knight is daughter or very nearly akin to the great roque's carry me where you please i will have no will but yours especially if you deign to employ it in your service the cavalier replied with words no less polite and then all closing in around him they set out with him for the city to the music of the clarions and the drums as they were entering it the wicked one who is the author of all mischief and the boys who are wickeder than the wicked one contrived that a couple of these audacious irrepressible urchins should force their way through the crowd and lifting up one of them dapple's tail and the other rocinante's insert a bunch of furs under each the poor beasts felt the strange spurs and added to their anguish by pressing their tails tight so much so that cutting a multitude of capers they flung their masters to the ground don quixote covered with shame and out of countenance ran to pluck the plume from his poor jade's tail while sancho did the same for dapple his conductors tried to punish the audacity of the boys but there was no possibility of doing so for they hid themselves among the hundreds of others that were following them don quixote and sancho mounted once more and with the same music and acclamations reached their conductor's house which was large and stately that of a rich gentleman in short and there for the present we will leave them for such is cid hamet's pleasure End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 61 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 62 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 62 Which deals with the adventure of the enchanted head, together with other trivial matters which cannot be left untold. Don Quixote's host was one Don Antonio Moreno by name, a gentleman of wealth and intelligence, and very fond of diverting himself in any fair and good-natured way and having don quixote in his house he set about devising modes of making him exhibit his mad points in some harmless fashion for jests that give pain are no jests and no sport is worth anything if it hurts another the first thing he did was to make don quixote take off his armour and lead him in that tight chamois suit we have already described and depicted more than once out on a balcony overhanging one of the chief streets of the city 
in full view of the crowd and of the boys who gazed at him as they would at a monkey the cavaliers in livery careered before him again as though it were for him alone and not to enliven the festival of the day that they wore it and sancho was in high delight for it seemed to him that how he knew not he had fallen upon another camacho's wedding another house like don diego de miranda's another castle like the duke's some of don antonio's friends dined with him that day and all showed honour to don quixote and treated him as a knight-errant and he becoming puffed up and exalted in consequence could not contain himself for satisfaction such were the drolleries of sancho that all the servants of the house and all who heard him were kept hanging upon his lips while at table don antonio said to him we hear worthy sancho that you are so fond of manjar blanco and forced meat balls that if you have any left you keep them in your bosom for the next day no senor that's not true said sancho for i am more cleanly than greedy and my master don quixote here knows well that we two are used to live for a week on a handful of acorns or nuts to be sure if it so happens that they offer me a heifer i run with a halter i mean i eat what i'm given and make use of opportunities as i find them but whoever says that i'm an out-of-the-way eater or not cleanly let me tell him that he is wrong and i'd put it in a different way if i did not respect the honourable beards that are at the table indeed said don quixote sancho's moderation and cleanliness in eating might be inscribed and graved on plates of brass to be kept in eternal remembrance in ages to come it is true that when he is hungry there is a certain appearance of veracity about him for he eats at a great pace and chews with both jaws but cleanliness he is always mindful of and when he was governor he learned how to eat daintily so much so that he eats grapes and even pomegranate pips with a fork what said don antonio has sancho been a governor ay said sancho and of an island called barataria i governed it to perfection for ten days and lost my rest all the time and learned to look down upon all the governments in the world i got out of it by taking to flight and fell into a pit where i gave myself up for dead and out of which i escaped alive by a miracle don quixote then gave them a minute account of the whole affair of sancho's government with which he greatly amused his hearers on the cloth being removed don antonio taking don quixote by the hand passed with him into a distant room in which there was nothing in the way of furniture except a table apparently of jasper resting on a pedestal of the same upon which was set up after the fashion of the busts of the roman emperors a head which seemed to be of bronze don antonio traversed the whole apartment with don quixote and walked round the table several times and then said now senor don quixote that i am satisfied that no one is listening to us and that the door is shut i will tell you of one of the rarest adventures or more properly speaking strange things that can be imagined on condition that you will keep what i say to you in the remotest recesses of secrecy i swear it said don quixote and for greater security i will put a flagstone over it for i would have you know senor don antonio he had by this time learned his name that you are addressing one who though he has ears to hear has no tongue to speak so that you may safely transfer whatever you have in your bosom into mine and rely upon it that you have consigned it to the depths of silence in reliance upon that promise said don antonio i will astonish you with what you shall see and hear and relieve myself of some of the vexation it gives me to have no one to whom i can confide my secrets for they are not of a sort to be entrusted to everybody don quixote was puzzled wondering what could be the object of such precautions whereupon don antonio taking his hand passed it over the bronze head and the whole table and the pedestal of jasper on which it stood and then said this head senor don quixote has been made and fabricated by one of the greatest magicians and wizards the world ever saw a pole i believe by birth and a pupil of the famous escotillo of whom such marvellous stories are told he was here in my house and for a consideration of a thousand crowns that i gave him he constructed this head which has the property and virtue of answering whatever questions are put to its ear he observed the points of the compass he traced figures he studied the stars he watched favourable moments and at length brought it to the perfection we shall see to-morrow 
for on fridays it is mute and this being friday we must wait till the next day in the interval your worship may consider what you would like to ask it and i know by experience that in all its answers it tells the truth don quixote was amazed at the virtue and property of the head and was inclined to disbelieve don antonio but seeing what a short time he had to wait to test the matter he did not choose to say anything except that he thanked him for having revealed to him so mighty a secret they then quitted the room don antonio locked the door and they repaired to the chamber where the rest of the gentlemen were assembled in the meantime sancho had recounted to them several of the adventures and accidents that had happened to his master that afternoon they took don quixote out for a stroll not in his armour but in street costume with a surcoat of tawny cloth upon him that at that season would have made ice itself sweat orders were left with the servants to entertain sancho so as not to let him leave the house don quixote was mounted not on rocinante but upon a tall mule of easy pace and handsomely caparisoned they put the surcoat on him and on the back without his perceiving it they stitched a parchment on which they wrote in large letters this is don quixote of la mancha don quixote was amazed to see how many people gazed at him called him by his name and recognized him and turning to don antonio who rode at his side he observed to him great are the privileges knight errantry involves for it makes him who professes it known and famous in every region of the earth see don antonio even the very boys of the city know me without ever having seen me true senor don quixote returned don antonio for as fire cannot be hidden or kept secret virtue cannot escape being recognized and that which is attained by the profession of arms shines distinguished above all others it came to pass however that as don quixote was proceeding amid the acclamations that have been described a castilian reading the inscription on his back cried out in a loud voice the devil take thee for a don quixote of la mancha what art thou here and not dead of the countless drubbings that have fallen on thy ribs thou art mad and if thou wert so by thyself and kept thyself within thy madness it would not be so bad but thou hast the gift of making fools and blockheads of all who have anything to do with thee or say to thee why look at these gentlemen bearing thee company get thee home blockhead and see after thy affairs and thy wife and children and give over these fooleries that are sapping thy brains and skimming away thy wits go your own way brother said don antonio and don't offer advice to those who don't ask you for it senor don quixote is in his full senses and we who bear him company are not fools virtue is to be honoured wherever it may be found go and bad luck to you and don't meddle where you are not wanted by god your worship is right replied the castilian for to advise this good man is to kick against the pricks still for all that it fills me with pity that the sound wit they say the blockhead has in everything should dribble away by the channel of his knight errantry but may the bad luck your worship talks of follow me and all my descendants if from this day forth though i should live longer than methuselah i ever give advice to anybody even if he asks me for it the advice-giver took himself off and they continued their stroll but so great was the press of the boys and people to read the placard that don antonio was forced to remove it as if he were taking off something else night came and they went home and there was a lady's dancing party for don antonio's wife a lady of rank and gaiety beauty and wit had invited some friends of hers to come and do honour to her guest and amuse themselves with his strange delusions several of them came they supped sumptuously the dance began at about ten o'clock among the ladies were two of a mischievous and frolicsome turn and though perfectly modest somewhat free in playing tricks for harmless diversion's sake these two were so indefatigable in taking don quixote out to dance that they tired him down not only in body but in spirit it was a sight to see the figure don quixote made long lank lean and yellow his garments clinging tight to him ungainly and above all anything but agile the gay ladies made secret love to him and he on his part secretly repelled them but finding himself hard pressed by their blandishments he lifted up his voice and exclaimed fugite 
Parates adversae, leave me in peace, unwelcome overtures. Avaunt with your desires, ladies, for she who is queen of mine, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, suffers none but hers to lead me captive and subdue me. And so saying, he sat down on the floor in the middle of the room, tired out and broken down by all this exertion in the dance. Don Antonio directed him to be taken up bodily and carried to bed and the first that laid hold of him was Sancho, saying as he did so, In an evil hour you took to dancing, master mine. Do you fancy all mighty men of valour are dancers, and all knights errant given to capering? If you do, I can tell you, you are mistaken. There's many a man would rather undertake to kill a giant than cut a caper. If it had been the shoe-fling you were at, I could take your place, for I can do the shoe-fling like a gerfalcon, but I'm no good at dancing. With these and other observations Sancho set the whole ballroom laughing, and then put his master to bed, covering him up well so that he might sweat out any chill caught after his dancing. The next day Don Antonio thought he might as well make trial of the enchanted head, and with Don Quixote, Sancho, and two others, friends of his, besides the two ladies who had tired out Don Quixote at the ball, who had remained for the night with Don Antonio's wife, he locked himself up in the chamber where the head was. He explained to them the property it possessed, and entrusted the secret to them, telling them that now for the first time he was going to try the virtue of the enchanted head. But except Don Antonio's two friends, no one else was privy to the mystery of the enchantment. And if Don Antonio had not first revealed it to them, they would have been inevitably reduced to the same state of amazement as the rest, so artfully and skilfully was it contrived. The first to approach the ear of the head was Don Antonio himself, and in a low voice, but not so low as not to be audible to all, he said to it, Head, tell me by the virtue that lies in thee, what am I at this moment thinking of? The head, without any movement of the lips, answered in a clear and distinct voice, so as to be heard by all, I cannot judge of thoughts. All were thunderstruck at this, and all the more so as they saw that there was nobody anywhere near the table or in the whole room that could have answered. How many of us are here? asked Don Antonio once more. And it was answered him in the same way softly, Thou and thy wife, with two friends of thine and two of hers, and a famous knight called Don Quixote of La Mancha, and a squire of his, Sancho Panza by name. Now there was fresh astonishment. Now everyone's hair was standing on end with awe. And Don Antonio, retiring from the head, exclaimed, this suffices to show me that I have not been deceived by him who sold thee to me, O oh, sage head, talking head, answering head, wonderful head. Let someone else go and put what question he likes to it. And as women are commonly impulsive and inquisitive, the first to come forward was one of the two friends of Don Antonio's wife, and her question was, Tell me, head, what shall I do to be very beautiful? And the answer she got was, Be very modest. I question thee no further, said the fair querist. Her companion then came up and said, I should like to know, head, whether my husband loves me or not. The answer given to her was, Think how he uses thee, and thou mayest guess. And the married lady went off, saying, That answer did not need a question, for of course the treatment one receives shows the disposition of him from whom it is received. Then one of Don Antonio's two friends advanced and asked it, Who am I? thou knowest was the answer that is not what i ask thee said the gentleman but to tell me if thou knowest me yes i know thee thou art don pedro noriz was the reply i do not seek to know more said the gentleman for this is enough to convince me o head that thou knowest everything and as he retired the other friend came forward and asked it tell me head what are the wishes of my eldest son i have said already was the answer that I cannot judge of wishes. However, I can tell thee the wish of thy son is to bury thee. That's what I see with my eyes, I point out with my finger, said the gentleman, so I ask no more. Don Antonio's wife came up and said, I know not what to ask thee, head. I would only seek to know of thee if I shall have many years of enjoyment of my good husband. And the answer she received was, Thou shalt, for his vigor and his temperate habits promise many years of life which by their intemperance others so often cut short. Then Don Quixote came forward and said, Tell me, thou that answerest, 
was that which i describe as having happened to me in the cave of montesinos the truth or a dream will sancho's whipping be accomplished without fail will the disenchantment of dulcinea be brought about as to the question of the cave was the reply there is much to be said there is something of both in it sancho's whipping will proceed leisurely the disenchantment of dulcinea will attain its due consummation i seek to know no more said don quixote let me but see dulcinea disenchanted and i will consider that all the good fortune i could wish for has come upon me all at once the last questioner was sancho and his questions were head shall i by any chance have another government shall i ever escape from the hard life of a squire shall i get back to see my wife and children to which the answer came thou shalt govern in thy house and if thou returnest to it thou shalt see thy wife and children and on ceasing to serve thou shalt cease to be a squire good by god said sancho panza i could have told myself that the prophet perogullo could have said no more what answer wouldst thou have beast said don quixote is it not enough that the replies this head has given suit the questions put to it yes it is enough said sancho but i should have liked it to have made itself plainer and told me more the questions and answers came to an end here but not the wonder with which all were filled except don antonio's two friends who were in the secret this seed hamet benengeli thought fit to reveal at once not to keep the world in suspense fancying that the head had some strange magical mystery in it he says therefore that on the model of another head the work of an image maker which he had seen at madrid don antonio made this one at home for his own amusement and to astonish ignorant people and its mechanism was as follows the table was of wood painted and varnished to imitate jasper and the pedestal on which it stood was of the same material with four eagle's claws projecting from it to support the weight more steadily the head which resembled a bust or figure of a roman emperor and was coloured like bronze was hollow throughout as was the table into which it was fitted so exactly that no trace of the joining was visible the pedestal of the table was also hollow and communicated with the throat and neck of the head and the whole was in communication with another room underneath the chamber in which the head stood through the entire cavity in the pedestal table throat and neck of the bust or figure there passed a tube of tin carefully adjusted and concealed from sight in the room below corresponding to the one above was placed the person who was to answer with his mouth to the tube and the voice as in an ear trumpet passed from above downwards and from below upwards the words coming clearly and distinctly it was impossible thus to detect the trick a nephew of don antonio's a smart sharp-witted student was the answerer and as he had been told beforehand by his uncle who the persons were that would come with him that day into the chamber where the head was it was an easy matter for him to answer the first question at once and correctly the others he answered by guesswork and being clever cleverly seed hamet adds that this marvellous contrivance stood for some ten or twelve days but that as it became noised abroad through the city that he had in his house an enchanted head that answered all who asked questions of it don antonio fearing it might come to the ears of the watchful sentinels of our faith explained the matters to the inquisitors who commanded him to break it up and have done with it lest the ignorant vulgar should be scandalized by don quixote however and by sancho the head was still held to be an enchanted one and capable of answering questions though more to don quixote's satisfaction than sancho's the gentlemen of the city to gratify don antonio and also to do the honours to don quixote and give him an opportunity of displaying his folly made arrangements for a tilting at the ring in six days from that time which however for reason that will be mentioned hereafter did not take place don quixote took a fancy to stroll about the city quietly and on foot for he feared that if he went on horseback the boys would follow him so he and sancho and two servants that don antonio gave him set out for a walk thus it came to pass that going along one of the streets don quixote lifted up his eyes and saw written in very large letters over a door books printed here at which he was vastly pleased for until then he had never seen a printing office and he was curious to know what it was like he entered with all his following and saw them drawing sheets in one place correcting in another setting up type here revising there 
in short all the work that is to be seen in great printing offices he went up to one case and asked what they were about there the workman told him he watched them with wonder and passed on he approached one man among others and asked him what he was doing the workman replied senor this gentleman here pointing to a man of prepossessing appearance and a certain gravity of look has translated an italian book into our spanish tongue and i am setting it up in type for the press what is the title of the book asked don quixote to which the author replied senor in italian the book is called le bagatelle and what does le bagatelle import in our spanish asked don quixote le bagatelle said the author is as though we should say in spanish los sujetes but though the book is humble in name it has good solid matter in it i said don quixote have some little smattering of italian and i plume myself on singing some of ariosto's stanzas but tell me senor i do not say this to test your ability but merely out of curiosity have you ever met with the word piñata in your book yes often said the author and how do you render that in spanish how should i render it returned the author but by olla body of me exclaimed don quixote what a proficient you are in the italian language i would lay a good wager that where they say in italian piace you say in spanish place and where they say piu you say mas and you translate su by arriba and hiu by abajo i translate them so of course said the author for those are their proper equivalents i would venture to swear said don quixote that your worship is not known in the world which always begrudges their reward to rare wits and praiseworthy labours what talents lie wasted there what genius thrust away into corners what worth left neglected still it seems to me that translation from one language into another if it be not from the queens of languages the greek and the latin is like looking at flemish tapestries on the wrong side for though the figures are visible they are full of threads that make them indistinct and they do not show with the smoothness and brightness of the right side and translation from easy languages argues neither ingenuity nor command of words any more than transcribing or copying out one document from another but i do not mean by this to draw the inference that no credit is to be allowed for the work of translating for a man may employ himself in ways worse and less profitable to himself this estimate does not include two famous translators dr cristobal de figueroa in his pastor fido and don juan de jauregui in his aminta wherein by their felicity they leave it in doubt which is the translation and which the original but tell me are you printing this book at your own risk or have you sold the copyright to some bookseller i print at my own risk said the author and i expect to make a thousand ducats at least by this first edition which is to be of two thousand copies that will go off in a twinkling at six reals apiece a fine calculation you are making said don quixote it is plain you don't know the ins and outs of the printers and how they play into one another's hands i promise you when you find yourself saddled with two thousand copies you will feel so sore that it will astonish you particularly if the book is a little out of the common and not in any way highly spiced what said the author would your worship then have me give it to a bookseller who will give three maravedis for the copyright and think he's doing me a favour i do not print my books to win fame in the world for i am known in it already by my works i want to make money without which reputation is not worth a rap god send your worship good luck said don quixote and he moved on to another case where he saw them correcting a sheet of a book with the title of light of the soul noticing it he observed books like this though there are many of the kind are the ones that deserve to be printed for many are the sinners in these days and lights unnumbered are needed for all that are in darkness he passed on and saw they were also correcting another book and when he asked its title they told him it was called the second part of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by one of tordesillas i have heard of this book already said don quixote and verily and on my conscience i thought it had been by this time burned to ashes as a meddlesome intruder but its martinmas will come to it as it does to every pig for fictions have the more merit and charm about them the more nearly they approach the truth or what looks like it and true stories the truer they are the better they are and so saying he walked out of the printing office with a certain amount of displeasure in his looks 
that same day don antonio arranged to take him to see the galleys that lay at the beach whereat sancho was in high delight as he had never seen any all his life don antonio sent word to the commandant of the galleys that he intended to bring his guest the famous don quixote of la mancha of whom the commandant and all the citizens had already heard that afternoon to see them and what happened on board of them will be told in the next chapter End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 62 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine